Tell us a little bit more about this investment, these investments, I should say, from 6th Street and Dial. Minority investors, why did you take them on? What opportunity does it present for you? Sure. Um, thanks for having me, Vani. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Um, the um, really exciting time at our firm with the completion of our succession plan and bringing on a new strategic partner in TPG 6th Street Partners. Um, their management company is buying a stake in our management company, so it's not a fund investment for them. It's a partner-to-partner -partner investment, which is important. And they're really a natural partner for us, um, given I have a multi-decade decade relationship with their partner group. We all work together back at Goldman Sachs in the special situations group before I joined Barton Hill and before they founded TSSP. Um, and we've been finding, looking for and finding ways to partner together um, in a more real way for the past several years, and so it's nice to have this transaction completed. Um, in addition, Dial Capital, who's an existing minority investor with the firm, is putting capital in as well, um, showing a sign of faith in our business and reiterating their commitment to us. And um, that's exciting for us um, just from a continuing partnership perspective. And last but not least, our, myself and other managing partners and principals of our firm are also investing our own dollars into the management company. So when you think about this transaction, you know, a lot of other transactions in our space, um, whether it's go public or stay private, they involve some form of taking chips off the table or, or cashing out. And that's exactly the opposite of what we're doing here. So no partner is selling in the transaction to the purchasers. Partners are putting additional capital into the firm, in fact, doubling down on ourselves and on our future. And the net proceeds of transaction expenses are actually going to go on balance sheet to fund future growth. And we're really excited about the new partnerships and continuing with our old partnerships. Well, it must be sad to say goodbye to the Halcyon name, but it's done you well. Your returns, according to our reporting, are more than 10% in the year through, uh, through this month. In the year through June, it was, it was 10%. So obviously, you're finding great opportunities. Is it because you have a slightly different view of where we are in the economic cycle and maybe expand on what that view is? Sure. So um, I, I think we hear a lot of reporting and, and you see a lot in the press about, about the duration of the cycle, but what people really aren't focused as much on is the magnitude of the cycle. So from a duration perspective, obviously it's the second longest cycle we've seen um, over nine years in, uh, but that really shouldn't be surprising to anybody. If you look at the last four economic cycles, they've been four of the six longest in the history of our country. So cycles are lasting longer. That shouldn't be surprising. But from a magnitude perspective, if you go back to several of the last couple cycles, go back to the 80s, the economic recovery in the 80s, 39% GDP growth. Economic recovery in the 90s, 43% GDP growth. This current cycle, 22% only. So it feels longer, but it's not really larger yet. Um, so there are lots of reasons to believe this cycle can continue. Um, you have very high consumer confidence levels, highest in 18 years. Companies' ability to pass on interest rate, pass on increased costs is highest in a decade. Um, unemployment's obviously very low, almost 50 year lows. And in the context of all that, we're only seeing core PC inflation at 2%, which is the Fed's target. So, um, so we think this cycle could last a lot longer. Um, in my seat, you have to be careful not to conflate economic cycles with market cycles. And so even if your view is that we'll see continued economic growth, um, these mini market cycles, um, you have to be prepared for them, you have to be positioned for them. And if you're clear headed when they happen, that's where we see a lot of opportunity. Jason, um, may I ask you to take a sort of step back? Over the last four or five days, money has been absolutely pouring out of credit ETFs. What would you say to the people that are selling right now? Kind of where are we? What are you seeing? Sure. So um, it's a great question. And I think our view of this is, is most of that is in fixed rate assets because you're seeing uh, longer duration, uh, treasury yields, et cetera, rising. You're seeing the ECB pull back from QE. Um, and so our view, um, look, you want to be positioned in this economic part of the cycle when we're in a raising rate environment in away from fixed rate assets and into floating rate assets. So corporate bank loans, and for, for example, where you capture that uptick in short term rates. Um, and that's the exposure we want to have in today's market environment. So less fixed rate, less long duration. You want to be in shorter duration and more floating rate instruments. Can I, can I just come back to what you were saying just a moment ago? and kind of tease it out a little bit more. What, what, is the, what is the move in Treasury yields up telling you? I, trying to determine the signal to noise here is quite interesting. Is it telling us that the economy is doing fine and we're just reappraising where we are with the Fed? I, what, are we, what, are we, what are we getting from this move? What is the signal? Sure. So I think the, I think the signal really is uh, you've seen a lot of, of movement toward a more hawkish stance from a Fed perspective. 
And, and you've seen that not only in removing accommodative from the Fed minutes, the word accommodative, but also in the commentary from, um, from Fed Chair Powell in the last week and change around rates and, and, and future path of rates. Um, but the reality, in our view, again, is you have to put this all in, in historical context. So we're raising rates now 25 basis points every couple meetings. If you go back just a couple decades, you know, we're raising rates 2 to 3% a clip per meeting. Um, our, our view is the Fed will actually remain accommodative and, and remain dovish. So watch what they do, not what they say. Um, and I think that's good for risk assets and it's good for the cycle moving forward. Um, certainly the market has reacted in a, in a relatively dramatic way from a treasury yield perspective on the latest commentary. Um, most, most banks, large banks, think four to five interest rate increases in the next year. We're, we're going to take the under. It's not often we get to talk to somebody like you that invests the way you do. So I want to get into some of the special opportunities that you're seeing right now, particularly, uh, let's say, given that we have had a lot of merger arbitrage opportunities. Yeah, so merger arbitrage is a very interesting space. I think when you're in a period um, market-wise where risk assets are priced uh, very well, we'll say, we'll say priced at at least fair market value, um, you want to find places that are shorter duration and less correlated to invest. And we believe we're finding that in merger arbitrage today. There's a very interesting supply-demand dynamic in merger arbitrage right now. From a supply perspective, um, we are at, uh, th through the third quarter, we're at either the first or second highest of all time in terms of announced global merger volume. It depends on whose data you believe. And so the supply side is very robust and healthy. And the demand side is a little bit on their heels and squeamish. And the reason for that is through the same period, we're either the second or third highest deal breaks ever, ever on record. So um, specifically, if there's any uh, deal related to antitrust concerns, um, issues that's around politics or trade war, um, the spreads on these deals are dramatically wide and in many cases uh, wider than they really should be. Um, so we're seeing lots of opportunity in standard merger arbitrage, also in bidding wars, record cash on balance sheets. Companies are flush with cash. They need to do something with that cash. Either you turn it to fair shareholders, pay down debt, or, or you buy something. Um, and you see that in bidding wars. Sky was a great recent example. Um, asset that you can't replicate two very large companies bidding for it, and you want to be around when the envelopes are open in those situations. So I want to know what exactly you did when it came to the Sky deal. I also want to know about this European short on Casino. Sure. Um, so we'll take the first part first. So, so in Sky, um, look, I think a lot of people uh, at the end of the day, right before the weekend when the bidding war was, was going to consummate, um, Sky was trading well through the price of the last bid, and, and there was logic around, for sure, taking some risk off the table. Um, we added a little bit of risk there. We were very positive on the dynamic, um, again, especially with two very large companies who there's no way to replicate this asset. And when you see that uh, type of dynamic, you, you want to be around and invested for, for that end date. Um, on, on Casino, is a, is a European credit short. Last time I was with you, I talked about another European credit short. Um, so what's interesting about Casino to us, um, despite its name, it's a French grocery business, mm -hmm. although it does operate uh, financially and operation-wise, act more like a casino than a, than a grocer. I um, mean, there's lots of intrigue around this name. You know, there's, there's uh, fake reporters going to interview short sellers. There's a potential he said, she said acquisition of the company um, with, with one of their competitors. Uh, there's, there's obfuscated credit documents. Um, lots of inter-party, intercompany transactions. And so at a big picture level, um, uh, there's eight billion in change of debt. Uh, we like being short the debt. We're short specifically the 3.311% bonds. They were downgraded from IG to high yield, and now they trade at a coupon of four and change percent. Um, and they trade just below par. Um, so these bonds are a good short for really two main reasons. There's about 20 reasons, but I'll walk, into the first, walk you through the first two. Um, one is the company reports EBITDA of about 1.9 billion euros. So it sounds like a rel relatively healthy EBITDA number. The issue is that about a billion of that is from subsidiaries where they don't, they don't control and no dividends go up to casino from those subsidiaries. So when you're talking about ability to service debt, it's really just the 900 million that's left from France. And the problem with the France operating business is that their free cash flow negative is several hundred million dollars a year. So it's going to be challenging to repay all this debt over time. The second reason is you are not aligned with management here. So this company is structured like a Russian nesting doll. And the key holding company above you is called Rally. And Rally is where all the equity owns their, or the management owns their equity. The problem with Rally is there's three billion of debt sitting at Rally. And the only asset that really pays off that debt are dividends from casino, mm -hmm. right? So management is highly unlikely to turn that dividend down, because if they do, their equity is evaporated. And you as a bondholder, every euro that goes out to repay 
rally debt is a euro that's not available to repay your debt. And when you're a free cash flow negative business, um, in our view, it's potentially a matter of time until this defaults. And the reality, what we really like about this short as well, is so let's say let's say they thread the needle and they're right and they get they they're able to solve this debt problem. You know, we're down four and change percent a year on our short. Um, and if they don't, um, this what you know, watch out below. These bonds could drop twenty to forty points pretty immediately. Jason, as you say, we're trading just subpar now, ninety six. Um, what is the potential downside on that? Where could that go? Could they dispose of assets as well? There was rumors floating around a little while ago that they could dispose of the Brazilian assets. And I wonder whether or not that would be a logical move right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we calculate even if they dispose of the assets with the assets at market value, which, by the way, um, you know, would be potentially very challenging to do so given their large stake ownership. But even if they do that, we think the business is levered pro forma eight times. And we think the business is structurally worth about six times. So recoveries are in the you know, 70% range, even if they're able to do that in our view.